testing. There we go, that's better. All right. Today we're going to look at chapter five. Physical Science 101, chapter five, temperature and heat. We've covered topics now in classical physics that take us up through uh, concepts of kinematics, how things move, uh, how forces cause things to move, then uh, let's see. Yes, how forces cause things to move. And then concepts of work and energy. Now we're going to take a specific look at one type of energy. And that is heat. And heat is uh, definable by virtue of its temperature. So let's share the PowerPoints. Here we go. And get us a slideshow going. There we are. Temperature and heat. Uh, the story of temperature and heat makes a fascinating discussion. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time, so we're going to have to sort of abbreviate that discussion. <clears throat> but the, uh, the Industrial Revolution uh, owes its beginning to theoretical and practical investigations into uh, temperature and heat. Now we can talk about hot and cold, of course, our relative terms. In other words, how hot is hot and how cold is cold. <clears throat> and those are only qualitative descriptions. Uh, you can say something is colder than something else or hotter than something else. And, and that in itself is instructive because uh, the, the concept of heat is relative at its core. In other words, heat will not transfer from one place to another unless there is a temperature difference. And heat always transfers from the hotter to the colder. That's spontaneous. <clears throat> but we need a, a quantitative approach as well. So we define temperature in terms of the motion of the molecules in the substance that, um, that we are investigating. And temperature is by definition, the, uh, the average 
some form, some type of average of the kinetic energy of all the molecules in the substance. So if the kinetic energy of all the molecules, in other words, they're moving faster, or they're, they're vibrating faster, uh, they will have more energy and a higher temperature. But we need something to, we need some device that will allow us to measure because um, our sense of hot and cold is not quantifiable. In other words, I, I can say something feels hot or it feels cold, but I can't tell you what the temperature is in, in absolute quantitative values. So it was then up to uh, scientists to invent devices otherwise known as thermometers, that would uh, quantify this physical property of matter, the temperature. And usually the way it was done was to take advantage of the fact that as the temperature increases, most substances will expand. In other words, as the kinetic energy of the molecules inside increases, they need more shoulder room. So they bump into each other and they move each other apart and that causes expansion. And that thermal expansion is a physical property that um, responds to a change in kinetic energy, a change in temperature. So, uh, this expansion or contraction of, say, a metal, which is a, a good place to start, uh, will measure temperature. Uh, or even liquids will increase as the temp will increase in volume as the temperature increases. And mercury takes advantage of both of these. It's both a metal and a liquid. And mercury was was. Uh, one of the first choices of scientists in inventing this device. Now, for instance, how does a bimetallic strip work? Well, um, both iron and brass individually will change their lengths as the temperature increases. But <clears throat> they do so at different rates. In other words, iron will um, expand and a rod of iron will get longer as the temperature increases and so will brass. But they do so at different rates. So if we increase the temperature of the iron bar by 10 degrees, it will expand by a certain amount. That's the symbol for iron, by the way. So if we increase the temperature by 10 degrees, then we'll get an increase in length. If we have brass, which is an alloy of copper and um, nickel, and we increase the temperature by 10 degrees. It will expand even more than iron will. So one possibility is you just nail this end down and you set a scale up here and you say, okay, 10 degrees means this many marks, 10 more degrees means that many marks. <clears throat> And that works, um, but the, the concept of the bimetallic stri strip makes for a more compact device because if we attach these both together, like that, this one only expands that much, this one expands that much. Well, if they're, if they're melded together, then this one's going to expand more, this one expands less, and it causes the, the whole strip to curve. And that's what this illustration shows. So the strip curves, 
and in that case, what happens is the end of it now will move up and down with a change in temperature. And that way you can make your scale this way instead of that way. It makes for a more compact device. So in this case with a bimetallic strip, you're actually measuring uh, what degree of deflection is the strip making and it's proportional to the temperature. Um, we still use these devices today. Uh, air conditioning thermostats um, are this type. And in fact, the bimetallic strip is not just a straight strip, but it's a coil. So it's nailed down here. And as this expands, it tends to drag a needle around and it can be placed in a dial situation. Okay, so that's one type of temperature measurement, a thermometer. Uh, it wasn't the it wasn't the first practical one that was invented um, centuries ago. Uh, actually, a more practical version, actually not necessarily practical, but more accurate device was to place a liquid in a glass tube and seal the tube and then make markings on the outside of the tube that would be proportional as the liquid inside expanded, then it would show a uh, change in temperature and could be measured by those markings. So we have a, um, a glass bulb here. And then this is a thick tube here. So we have a really just a thin capillary up the center like that. This is a very thin wall. The bulb has to be very thin wall so that the transfer of energy takes place between the substance being measured and into the liquid. So let's say we're using mercury. Mercury will expand its volume as the temperature increases. And if you make this tube very narrow, then with a, a small change in volume, you get a huge change in length. It goes back to the, it goes back to the definition of uh, volume for a cylinder, the area of that circle times the height. So for the same change in volume, if you make the the um, diameter of that circle very narrow, then the same change in volume means a huge change in length. And a change in length is much easier to uh, measure and mark off in a thermometer than if you have a, a large bore in that tube. So you make a very narrow bore, a capillary in fact, and you can watch the, the change in temperature uh, much more accurately. So we need a way to calibrate our thermometer. All right? If we're going to make these measurements, we need to have reference points. And the typical reference point uh, for a thermometer is to use something that's commonly available and can be reproduced easily for any laboratory. The point at which water freezes is a good lower point for a cold point, and the point at which water boils is the high point. So we have the formation of ice formation of steam as our two endpoints. And then between those two points, you just mark it off in equal increments. And there you have a thermometer. So how, how do we know what the ice point is? Well, the ice point where you have, uh, if you have both ice and water together in contact, and they have to be pure, 
and there's always solid ice and there's always liquid water together, once they stabilize their temperature, if they're still both there, that temperature is constant. And that's your point for, for ice. Similarly for steam, if you have water and you're boiling it, you're producing steam, both there at the same time, then that temperature is constant. Now, uh, I put mercury in this thermometer, but it doesn't have to be mercury. In fact, most thermometers now that are of this design use colored alcohol because it's safer. Uh, mercury, of course, has the a toxicity problem. Unfortunately, for laboratories, uh, the mercury thermometer is much more accurate, but um, the disposal of those mercury thermometers has been mandated by government order, so we can't use them anymore. We have to use the less accurate alcohol-based thermometers. Although, we do have access now to electronic thermometers, and they can be made uh, just to be just as accurate as mercury thermometers once were. Uh, but that's another story. The uh, creation of these different temperature scales is also an interesting story. But th there are three that are uh, commonly used. Uh, one in, in uh, the, um, so still common in the United States is the Fahrenheit scale. In other words, when we say, uh, it's 32 degrees out, we know that there's potential for ice formation or snow. Uh, if we were in any other part of the world, we would say it's uh, zero degrees Celsius. That's this scale on the left versus this one on the right. And you find that there's the ice point, point at which water freezes. It's zero degrees for the Celsius scale and 32 degrees for Fahrenheit. So like I said before, Nature doesn't care. Nature just does what it does. The freezing point is fixed. It's, it's there and it happens. The difference is in uh, how we approach the problem, how we measure it. So if we measure it with this scale, it's that number. If we measure it with this scale, it's that number. It's still the same physical phenomenon. It's just we use a different uh, scale to measure each one. Uh, for the steam point, 100 degrees for the Celsius scale, 212 degrees for Fahrenheit. That seems kind of odd, you know, why would you choose 212 for a steam point and 32 for an ice point? Well, there's more to the story than that. So let's, let's move on. Um, this Fahrenheit system was developed by this person, Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit who was interested in uh, biological processes. And he wanted a, a thermometer that would measure, that would produce a measurement for human body temperature that was 100 degrees on his scale. So he chose the other values of his scale so that he would get 100 degrees for his um, body temperature measurement. And the way he did that was rather than use the simply the ice point as a fixed measurement, in this case 32 degrees, uh, his calibration was based upon the very coldest temperature that he could reliably produce. Zero degrees for him was ice and salt. And you know, when we freeze ice cream, you put salt on the ice, which lowers its temperature. So he did that to establish his zero degree point. And his 100 degree point was body temperature. Well, body temperature varies. He knew body temperature varied from one person to the next. So it was sort of a guessing game. So what he did was he said from here to 100 degrees, is body temperature. 
All right. So I've got 100 markings from here to here. How many more markings do I need to get to steam? And it turns out he needs um, 112 more markings to get to steam. So he knew steam would have to be here, ice would be there. And he also checked just pure ice water at 32. And then from then on, he was good to go with 32 as ice water and 212 as steam. So uh, Fahrenheit was satisfied here. Uh, in fact, he produced the first reliable available uh, thermometer. He built the first one. Uh, at first, he used alcohol in uh, 1709. And then he found that mercury worked a lot better. Uh, it has to do with the, the fact that uh, alcohol is uh, volatile, very volatile. It was difficult to make a thermometer with alcohol in those days uh, because it would, before you got finished making it, uh, half your alcohol was evaporated. So he used mercury instead and found that it worked much better because uh, even though mercury is a liquid, uh, it's not as volatile as alcohol. And in 1724, after he had produced these thermometers, he published his work. <clears throat> he made it available to the world. Okay. And I've already told you this information right here. It's just there in print so that you can have it as reference. Now the scale difference between 32 and 212 is 180 degrees. 180 degree marks between those two measurements. All right, uh, just remember that. The next system, which came along a little bit later, was Anders Celsius. I think he was, uh, he was either Danish or Swedish maybe. He was more interested in physical processes rather than biological processes. So he was perfectly happy to establish his scale at zero degrees for freezing and 100 degrees for boiling. So it was, it was a lot simpler process. And um, all of this takes place at one atmosphere pressure. Um, we haven't explained that yet, but uh, freezing points and boiling points change with pressure. So the, all this has to be uh, established at one atmosphere pressure. Now, the, the unique thing about Celsius work was um, he didn't just create a thermometer and publish his work and uh, make it available to the world. He also performed detailed careful experiments using temperature measurements. And his goal from the beginning was to establish uh, an, a temperature scale that was valid and useful for all sciences everywhere. So he went into much more detail and uh, his publication was, um, we would say today, scientifically based. Um, the next uh, step in the story uh, is attributed to William Thompson, who is also uh, Lord Kelvin. And in the middle of the 18th century, he also did some theoretical work and some practical work like uh, Celsius had done. And his investigations um, showed him that what was really needed in the sciences was an absolute temperature scale. In other words, we know that on the temperature scale of uh, zero to 100 Celsius, you can get things colder than zero degrees, right? Colder than ice, right? 
So you can have negative values down here. Go down to negative 100. Well, the problem with negatives in many of the calculations in sciences is um, they don't cooperate very well <laughs> with the mathematics of certain types of processes, particularly with gases. So what Lord Kelvin proposed was a temperature scale that had no negative numbers. In other words, zero would be as cold as you could get. You can't get colder. So uh, Lord Kelvin anchored his system on absolute zero as the zero point. Now, um, for should be obvious reasons, there's no way that you're ever going to get to zero. You cannot establish zero for the Kelvin scale. It's theoretical. Now, why is that? Why can't you ever get to zero? Well, you can never get anything as cold as absolute zero. Zero K, we don't use the degree. There's no degree there like that. It's just zero K. You can never get there, why? Because heat transfers from warm object to cold object, okay? So um, if you're gonna transfer all the heat out of something to make it down to zero degrees K, excuse me, zero K, then where's that heat gonna go? It can't go anywhere because there's nothing colder than that, right? So you're never gonna get to zero K. It's theoretical. <clears throat> and I've got a paper here. In fact, I got a copy of it right here. This is the uh, a modern reproduction of Kelvin's published work on this new temperature scale. He published it in 1848 in uh, the philosophical magazine called it on an absolute temperature scale and he based his work upon thermodynamic work that is uh, work that was being done with heat engines by both uh, by two researchers Sadie Carnot and Victor Rignault so he, he based his his uh, uh, proposal on sound thermodynamic principles. Okay. So, but <clears throat> uh, he made the transition from uh, current temperature systems of the day to his system as easy as possible. And he based his, um, his new scale on the same size degree mark as Celsius. So if we have a scale here and it's marked off in Celsius degrees, right? You go up to a uh, hundred here, maybe zero here for our anchor points there. Um, his scale would run parallel to that and have exactly the same size degree marks as Celsius. Okay, that was nice of him. How did he know where zero, the theoretical point was, right? Because you can't measure it, you can't calibrate it to zero to zero K. So he used gases. Temperature, volume the volume of a gas decreases as it gets colder, right? All you have to do is take an inflated balloon uh, and um, take it outside on a cold day and it'll shrink, right? So you know that gases shrink as they get colder. Well, what do they also do? If a gas gets cold enough, it'll turn to a liquid. But Kelvin was working on a theoretical basis. So he said, uh, let's suppose the ideal gas is one that stays a gas all the way down till the temperature is zero K. Right? You could actually measure right, at different temperatures, different volumes. 
So the volume is decreasing as the temperature decreases like that. But you can only go so far. So Kelvin said, all right, I'm gonna expand, extend that line out to here. Okay. So when it touches this axis, that means the volume is zero. And this is, actually this ought to be maybe a hundred here somewhere. Yeah, actually hundred here. Right, and when it, when your gas gets to zero volume at, um, that is the point for zero K. That's my absolute zero. It's when the volume of the gas drops to zero. Can't get any colder, can't get any smaller. That's it. That's the end of the line. This becomes zero K for Kelvin. And anything above that is always a positive number. But what is zero here? Well, as it turns out, this is minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. So that means on the Kelvin scale, this value is now 273 K for that zero value for Celsius. So when you're at the freezing point of water, you're actually at 273 K on that system. And that's why uh, if you wanna know Kelvin temperature, all you have to do is take Celsius temperature and add 273 to it. We chop off the last 0.15. Uh, for our purposes, we don't need that accuracy. Right, so 273 is, is plenty. That's one formula, how to convert back and forth between K and Celsius. If you know K and you wanna know Celsius, you just rearrange the equation and subtract 273 from K and you get Celsius. Okay, so that's where Kelvin came from. This just shows relationships, right? Uh, absolute zero for Kelvin is zero. Minus 273 is Celsius and actually minus 460 is absolute zero for Fahrenheit. There's another system that uses the Fahrenheit degree mark. Uh, it's called the Rankin, but I don't know anybody that uses it. Maybe some engineers use it, but for our purposes, we're only interested in Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. And these other matching points, right? These are natural, physical uh, characteristics, ice point, steam point, so forth. And uh, these are the values for the temperature scales that are applied to those real physical phenomena. Okay, now converting temperature for Celsius and Kelvin is easy. I've already shown you that one. That's, that's very simple. But we can also convert between Fahrenheit and Celsius. We just need to know how they're related. Well, we know that their zero points are different and we know that their degree marks are different. The Fahrenheit degree mark is smaller than the Celsius degree mark. Why do I know that? I'll show you. If we set up our system here, right? So that this is ice and this is steam, For Celsius, this point to this point is 100 degrees, right? This point to this point for Fahrenheit is 32 and 212. So we've got a difference here of 180 and a difference here of only 100, right? So to go between these two marks, you've got to go 180 steps. And to go between these marks, you go 100 steps. So these steps are bigger than those steps. That means the degree mark for Celsius is larger than the degree mark for Fahrenheit, right? So that's one point that has to be compensated. The other point is where's your zero mark? 
the zero mark for this one is down here. So we've got to adjust the scales to match the zero marks. Then we have to adjust the ratio of the two. 180 to 10 is the ratio. Uh, excuse me, 180 to 100 is the ratio. So the, the long and the short of that story is you have this ratio here. If you want to know Fahrenheit temperature, you take Celsius, multiply it by 1.8, which is the ratio of 180 to 100, and then add 32, because that adjusts the zero mark. Okay? Now, if you want a more uh, lengthy discussion and explanation for it, I've included this um, web page down here, which will give you a very good discussion of how this relationship, this formula is derived. But for now, just memorize it. Uh, when I memorized it, I didn't use 1.8. When I memorized it back when I was a student, it was Fahrenheit equals nine fifths centigrade plus 32 which is the same thing, nine fifths and 180 divided by 100 is 1.8. So it gets you the same place. It's just, that's the way I memorize it. So I always think in those terms. And you can solve for either one. This solves for Fahrenheit if you know Celsius. But remember, this is an algebraic expression. So if you know one and not the other, then you just solve for the unknown. So if we solve for this unknown, then it becomes Fahrenheit minus 32 and divide the whole thing through by 1.8. And that will give you Celsius. Here's an example. Normal body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Everybody knows that. So what would it be What would that equivalent temperature be in Celsius? Well, we know the formula, right? There it is. We solved it for Celsius on the previous slide. We just plug in 98.6 minus 32 and divide by 1.8, and you get 37 degrees exactly Celsius. All right. Here's another interesting problem. What if we take minus 40 degrees Celsius and convert it to Fahrenheit? What will we get? Well, there's our formula. Fahrenheit equals 1.8 times centigrade plus 32. Plug in the value. What do you get? You get minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the one point where in both temperature scales, you get the exact same magnitude, minus 40 centigrade uh, Celsius is minus 40 Fahrenheit. Now, believe me, that is very cold. <clears throat> I know how cold that is. I used to work um, in my youth for a hotel and restaurant supply house. So we would have both uh, fresh meat products, we'd have vegetables, we'd have dry goods, we'd have frozen products available to our customers. And uh, one of the freezers that we used was set at minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. It was what we called our blast furnace. So we'd make hamburger patties and we'd shove them in that blast furnace and they would freeze in minutes. Well, the problem is we would store things in there too, of course. And once a month, we would have to inventory our products. Well, I was the new guy. I was the young guy. So I, <laughs> every once a month, I would be the one that would have to go into that minus 40 degree freezer and inventory all that product. So I'd have my cap, I'd have big gauntlet gloves. I have a huge quilted, uh, uh, coat and I would stay in there for maybe 10 minutes at a time and I have to come back out into the cooler section and get warm 
So believe me, it was very cold. Okay, now that we know how to measure temperature, let's see if we can uh, wrap our minds around the concept of heat. Heat, in fact, is a measure of transfer of energy from one location to another. So you have to think of heat in terms of movement of this kinetic energy, right? We said that temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of all the molecules in a substance. So uh, if two substances say are in contact with one another, the hotter one is going to transfer some of its kinetic energy to the colder one. And that kinetic energy is the motion of the molecules inside the substance. Um, now, the, we, can, we can subdivide heat into kinetic and potential energy, uh, just like we did earlier with uh, positional uh, potential energy versus kinetic energy. The, uh, the actual kinetic energy has to do with the motion of the molecules. Now, these molecules can be moving translating whole molecules from one place to another. And the faster they move, the higher the temperature. Or they can be vibrating. You know, that's motion as well. But the potential energy of those molecules is contained in the bonds that hold the molecules together. OK, so here's our definition. Heat, in fact, is the energy that is transferred. In other words, we don't have an absolute way of measuring heat except by transferring some of it. And in fact, when we measure the temperature of something, we're transferring some of that heat energy from the substance into the thermometer in order to measure it. Right? So uh, ideally, you don't transfer much. You only need a little bit of it to register a temperature, but you still have to transfer some of the heat from the substance into the thermometer to measure its temperature. So heat is energy of transfer. And it always results from a temperature difference. You don't transfer heat if the two substances are at the same temperature. All right. Now, how do we quantify that heat? Well, <clears throat> um, there are several ways. The standard international unit for heat, uh, or, or energy for that matter, is the joule. Right? We've already established that in our discussion of work and energy. But a more common unit, particularly uh, in in this country is the calorie. The calorie is based upon how much heat it takes to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius at normal atmospheric pressure. Okay. So that's, that's how much heat is transferred. If you transfer a calorie of heat into a gram of water, So that's a gram, one gram of water. And you transfer heat in there of one calorie, then the temperature of that water will increase by one degree Celsius. That's the definition of a calorie of heat. Now, obviously, if you have a different substance than water, then that amount of heat will produce a different change in temperature. It's very specific to the substance. We chose water because it's readily available. It's a good standard. So that's the definition of our calorie. Well, that amount of heat was transferred, but joule is a measure of heat also. 
So they have to be related in some form or fashion, right? So we know by careful experiment and comparison that one calorie is also equal to 4.186 joule or rounded off to 4.2 joules, right? So now we have a conversion factor, right? If we, if we know how many calories is transferred, then we can convert that to joules. Let's just, for instance, say we have 10 calories that we've transferred. We're starting here, we wanna end up there, right? So we need a conversion factor. So which one of these, how do we need to cancel that? Well, this is in the numerator, that's in the denominator, and this is going to be left over, right? That's the way we construct our conversion factor. With the canceling factor, in the denominator and the leftover factor in the numerator. So now we know that 4.186 joules is equal to one calorie. That calorie cancels. 4.186 times 10 is 41.86 joules, right? So that's how you convert 10 calories to joules using this conversion factor. Now that actually is a very small amount of heat. And very often we, uh, particularly in, in chemistry and uh, actually in, in measurements of, of heat content of foods, we use a larger measure, the kilocalorie. In chemistry, we actually call it the kcal. All right? But when you read the label, if you pick up any package of uh, edibles in a grocery store and read the label, it will say so many calories per serving. That calorie is not the same as this calorie. That's what we call a big calorie. Instead of a small, it's a big calorie. So a kilocalorie is the calorie that's assigned to your foods. Right, one food calorie is actually 1,000 small calories, or one food calorie is one kilocalorie. All right, and in that case, obviously, a uh, thousand calories would be 4,186 joules or 4.2 kilojoules. <clears throat> okay, now there's another measurement and I'm just introducing this one because uh, it's still used in this country, the BTU, which stands for British Thermal Unit. And it by definition is the amount of heat it takes to raise one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. It's simple, that's just a, a statement of fact. That's a definition, one BTU. But they're all related, right? We're still transferring heat, so we can develop conversion factors that will convert from one to the other. One BTU is 1,055 joules, or one BTU is 0.25 kilocalories. Or, remember when we were talking about work and how you pay your electric bill, kilowatt hours, that's a unit of energy. So one BTU is equal to 0 0.00029 kilo, uh, kilowatt hours. All those are equivalent. Um, but if you know anybody, uh, or if you know your way around uh, air conditioning or heating units, or you know anybody that's in the business, you'll know that when they set you up with a heat pump or an air conditioning unit, they say this unit is rated two tons, three tons, five tons. What do they mean by that? It's another expression of um, energy transfer. But it's not just the amount of energy transferred, it's how fast does it occur. Remember when we talked about the time rate of work or the time rate of energy transfer? 
That's power. So the expression of uh, BTUs per hour, or actually tons, is an expression of power. Right? So one ton capacity for an air conditioning unit, a heat pump, so to speak, is uh, the one ton is the capacity of that unit to melt one ton of ice, 2,000 pounds, in 24 hours, right? So there's your time factor. That makes it a rating of power, not just a rating of energy or heat. Okay, and we have a conversion factor there also. So if you need to know what's the equivalent of one ton, it's equal to 12,000 BTUs per hour. 12,000 British thermal units per hour is equivalent to one ton. Remember, anytime you have an equivalence, you automatically have a conversion factor that's available to you if you need to make a conversion from one to the other. All right, so we've established before that uh, most things, uh, solids, liquids, and gases, will expand with an increase in temperature and contract with a decrease in temperature. There are some exceptions. Water is one exception, a very notable exception. When water freezes, it expands. Okay, that's why ice floats. Because if you get the same mass of water to occupy a greater volume, If you increase that volume, then the density goes down, right? So ice has more volume for the same mass, which means it has a lower density. And remember, if the density of the object is less than the fluid, then it will float in that fluid. Now, this is actually a good thing for us, that ice floats, because our world is covered in ice. Uh, in, in water, and occasionally it freezes. Now I'll explain why that is in just a second. Um, I'm going to skip that and come back to it. So what we notice is that uh, for a time, water does contract as you decrease the temperature. L look at this red line. As you go from 10 degrees down to four degrees, the density of water is increasing. That means its volume is decreasing, okay? And it reaches a maximum density at four degrees Celsius. But below four degrees, the crystal structure of the water starts to change. And that, change increases its volume. Now, what would cause water to increase its volume simply by changing its structure? Well, here's what happens. Notice that these water molecules are arranged in hexagons as they become solid. Look at all that empty space in there. When it's a liquid at temperatures of four degrees or higher, these water molecules are free to interact very intimately, and these spaces will be filled with water molecules. But as they approach the solid form, they tend to arrange themselves in this regular hexagonal form, and that expands them and opens this space up. And you can see evidence of that in any snowflake. It's always six-sided. Always, no exceptions, always six-sided because of this internal structure. So that increases the volume of frozen water. And that's why it occupies more volume, which decreases its density and makes it float. Okay, so what's, so, what's the big advantage of floating ice? Well, consider this. Our planet is covered two thirds of water. If 
water were just like every other substance. And as it got colder and turned to a solid, it became more dense. What would happen? The water that freezes at the surface in response to changes in air temperature would freeze and sink to the bottom. Okay. Sinking to the bottom means that now it's isolated from any air temperature changes. So if it warms up outside, the ice on the bottom will not melt. Several cycles of that would continue to freeze water, sink, freeze, sink, freeze, sink. Pretty soon, every body of water on the planet Earth would be one solid block of ice. <laughs> and we'd be in big trouble. So the fact that water floats when it freezes is a good thing. It freezes only to a certain depth and actually insulates the ice, the, the water below it. So all aquatic animals uh, and plants that are living underneath that ice can survive till that ice melts. Seasonal changes are possible then. Okay, so let's go back to this one I skipped. Everybody, well, I don't know if everybody has, but I always do. I'm interested in how things are built. In this case, a, a bridge. I've often wondered, what are these things that you uh, feel your tires hit every time you cross a bridge? As you get, on, get onto the bridge and exit the bridge, there's always this bump. Those are expansion joints. In other words, that bridge is made out of materials that will expand and contract as the temperature changes outside. And these joints are designed so that the bridge will has room to expand and contract without falling apart or buckling. Um, look at, at any concrete sidewalk, right? It has joints in it, doesn't it? Right, it has joints built in. It has two types of joints, actually. So there's your sidewalk. Okay. Now, it has uh, a joint here. And it's usually filled with some elastic material. This is an ex this is an expansion joint. So as these things heat up, they can move closer together. And that elastic material will squish and allow them to move closer together. But if they get really cold, then you wanna make allowances for controlled breakage. These are contraction joints. Those, those, actually, those joints are not there until this concrete contracts. When it gets cold and contracts, it pulls apart. And there's a break right there. All it takes is one winter, and you get a smooth break right there. Those are placed in there by just scoring the wet concrete at that point. So when it does start to shrink, that creates a weak spot and it, it's a controlled crack at that point. Okay, expansion contraction is allowed for in concrete sidewalks. Well, in pavements too, wherever you have roads that are built out of uh, concrete cement. Okay, expansion and contraction. All right. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier uh, when we were talking about the definition of the calorie, one calorie of heat will transfer it into one gram of water will cause that water's temperature to increase by one degree Celsius. 
if we have a different material, then the same amount of heat will cause the temperature to change a different amount. And we can measure that difference. We call it specific heat. The specific heat of a substance is the amount of heat that can be added to a substance to change its temperature by one degree Celsius. So water would be uh, a specific heat of one degree Celsius um, per calorie per gram of mass. So one degree C will change for every calorie that we add to one to every gram of that substance. Okay. Different substances have different specific heats. Now, by definition, of course, since the kilogram is the standard of mass, we need to base this upon the kilogram, right, rather than the gram. So as it turns out, the specific heat for, let's see, where is it? Excuse me. Uh, liquid water. Here it is, one. Actually, it's in terms of kilocalories. So this is also equal to um, one degree Celsius per kilocalorie per kilogram. Okay, so one kilocalorie added to one kilogram of, of water will raise its temperature one degree Celsius. Right. So actually these are equal. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay. <clears throat> so the greater the specific heat of a substance, the greater the amount of heat that it can absorb uh, to raise its temperature one degree Celsius. So if it has a higher specific heat than water, then it will take, uh, excuse me, that's not right. That's not right. Let's back up. Specific heat is the amount of heat, one calorie per uh, kilogram degree. There. That's that's the correct expression. One calorie added to one kilogram per degree, one degree change. Okay, so substances that have a higher specific heat than water will have a higher value here. So if it's two calories per kilogram degree Celsius, then it takes two calories required to change the temperature of one kilogram of substance one degree Celsius. Or if it's less than, say, one half specific heat, 0 0.5, then uh, it would take less heat to make the degree change for each one. Now, that has... Um, we don't have time to go into a detailed discussion of the matter now, but that this value is directly related to the molecular structure of the substance. Water's molecular structure is such that the molecules are very intimate with one another. They have very strong bonds between each other. So it takes more heat to uh, agitate them than it does for some other substances. And that's all I can say about it right now because we don't have time to discuss the details. 
These are examples of some substances and their specific heats, right? Oh, excuse me. There we go. Kilocalories per kilogram. And these values are specific for a given temperature. In other words, our starting temperature here is 20 degrees Celsius. Now, within a, a narrow range, these values will be valid. So the temperature can change maybe 20 or 30 or 40, even 40 degrees, uh, depending on the substance. Uh, and this value will be valid. But notice that air has a much smaller specific heat than water. Uh, let's see, ice is less than liquid water. Liquid water is here at one. So it looks like of our list here, water has the highest specific heat. And we've got two different units of measure here. Uh, joules per kilogram degrees Celsius versus kilocalories per kilogram degrees Celsius. Right? And these are relatable. So you can, you can create uh, conversion factors from them. In other words, this value is equivalent to that value. So you could make a conversion factor out of this chart for any one of these. Okay, uh, also I'll point out that uh, because the size of the degree mark for Celsius is exactly the same as the size of the degree mark for Kelvin, then joules per kilogram degree Celsius is the same magnitude, the same number value as joules per kilogram K. So that's convenient. You don't have to, you don't have to change the number to use degrees Celsius or K in your calculations, depending on which one you need, you use the same value. All right. Um, practical example here. As the temperature increases outside, say you're down at the beach, you'll notice that the water, the shallow, the water that's shallow here, of course, um, uh, is going to be cooler than the sand, right? You're walking on dry sand, it's hot. You're walking on wet sand, it gets cooler. Get in the water, it's even cooler. That's due to the specific heat capacity of each of these substances, right? The heat capacity of sand is much lower than it is for water. So uh, the same amount of heat applied to sand makes it hotter. Okay, the specific heat of a substance depends upon three factors. Right, and you can tell that from um, the specific heat units of measure itself. It depends upon the mass of the substance. Um, now this is kind of this is kind of circular logic here when you say the specific heat depends upon the specific heat. It's a, uh, what that what that should say is the specific heat depends upon the mass. It depends on the nature of the substance. Right? What type of substance is it? I mean, is it water? Is it iron? Is it concrete? sand, whatever, is it air? And it also depends on the amount of temperature change right here, okay? So how do we use specific heat? Well, there's a formula, right? In this case, we're saying heat, the amount of heat, and remember earlier, uh, I think in last chapter, um, I use the term Q instead of H. So I'm accustomed to using Q instead of H, but I'll do it this way so that you'll see that the relationship is equal. See, H in your textbook is equal to Q in my mind 
and that is equal to the mass times the specific heat times the change in temperature. Give me a few more minutes. So how do we know that that's going to work, right? This unit over here is going to be calories, right? This unit is going to be kilograms. And this is going to be degrees Celsius. So what does this need to be to give us calories? Well, well, actually, it's k calories. We have already established that the units of measure for specific heat are k calories per um, kilogram degree C. Numerator, numerator, denominator, denominator. Cancel, 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 cancel. Leaves us with kilocalories, kilocalories. So simple investigation of the units of measure tells us that uh, algebraically speaking, this is correct. This is calories. This whole expression together is calories. Now this value here, delta T, is a change in temperature. And remember, change is always final minus initial. Right? So if the temperature goes up, this is bigger than that, delta T will be positive. If the temperature goes down, then delta T will be negative, and Q will be negative. And remember what we said about transfer of heat into a system. See, so into the system, it's positive. So out of the system, it's negative. So by doing this calculation, we can tell actually whether the temperature, the heat transfer is into or out of the system simply by the sign that comes out of this, this calculation. All right, so there we have those values. Now, uh, one caveat. This formula only works as long as there is no phase change. In other words, you can't change from uh, solid to liquid or liquid to gas or the other direction for this to work. This only works as long as the phase is the same. If the liquid is, is undergoing a change in temperature, the solid is undergoing a change in temperature, or gas is undergoing a change in temperature, fine. But any transition between phases requires another approach. And I'm going to do that in a minute. We have an idea of what specific heat is and how to use it for materials that maintain a single phase. So what happens to that heat when it's added to a substance, as long as there's no phase change? What happens is the heat is added to the substance and it causes the kinetic energy of the individual molecules in that substance to increase. That's where all the energy goes into the substance, causing their kinetic energy to increase, both translational and vibrational. Now, here's an example what we can do with that information. How much heat does it take to heat 80 kilograms of bath water from 12 degrees to 42 degrees? So I'm going to leave this formula here because it's, it's useful. And then I'm going to write the information that's given in the problem. When you see a problem like this, it's most efficient to extract the information from the problem and put it in, in a form that's independent of the problem. How much heat in kilocalories does it take? How much heat? So the authors of your textbook use H, I use Q. So we're looking for that value. That's what the question is. We're also given the mass 
of the bath water. Bath water, and we have to assume that it just responds the same way that water would. So our C is going to be for a water. So it's one kilocalorie per kilogram degree Celsius. And that's one for water. Um, so how much mass do we have? Well, the mass is equal to 80 kilograms. That's given in the problem. And the temperature change is going from 12 to 42 degrees Celsius. So initial temperature is 12, right? 12 degrees. Final temperature is 42. All right. So what is that? That's a 30 degree change in temperature. Okay. So we know delta T is 30 degrees. We know C is one. Yeah. And we know mass is 80. Now, are our units compatible? Well, this uh, set of units here is one uh, kilocalories per kilogram degree centigrade. And this one is 80 kilograms. So in the numerator, kilograms, denominator, cancels. Degree C, numerator, denominator, cancels. We're left with kilocalories. So now all that's left is crunch the numbers. Just the math is left over. All right, so we have 80 times 1 times 30. So that's 2. yes. So that's 2.48 times 10 to the third. Kilocalories of heat. Okay, let's see if I did it right. There's our mass, there's a change in temperature, 30 degrees. Here's the specific heat for water. There's our calculation, and there's our answer. That says 2.4. Did I do my calculation correctly? 80. Right. Ah. There we go. Okay. 2.4 times 10 to the third kilocalories to raise the temperature of that bath water from 12 degrees Celsius to 42 degrees Celsius. Now, suppose, <clears throat> no, suppose if you're going to do that, you're going to have to pay for the, the energy required to heat that water. Well, we know how much heat is required, how much energy is required. We just need to know what is the cost of that energy. So since electrical energy, which is, we're assuming rather than gas, we're going to use electricity to heat the water. Um, we want to convert the energy, kilocalories, into kilowatt hours because electricity is sold by the kilowatt hour. So we need a conversion factor. And remember several slides ago, we had this conversion factor for kilowatt hours converted into kilocalories. So this cancels the kilocalories and converts it to kilowatt hours. So now we know that 2.8 kilowatt hours is the energy required. Now we need how much does that cost? Well, at 10 cents per kilowatt hour, it would cost 28 cents to heat the water in the bathtub. Because 10 times 2.8 is 28 cents. So it's not a lot of money, right? It's just if you do it day in and day out, by the end of the month, 
you know, it's a substantial amount of money. In fact, most of the, the money spent on electrical power is for heating or cooling the space that we live in. All right, here's another exercise. All right, let me see. There we go. How much heat do you have to remove from a liter of water that is initial temperature of 20 degrees Celsius so that it will cool to five degrees Celsius? All right, so we're given one liter of water, but we need to know the mass. Liter is a volume measurement, right? Um, so we need to know what's the equivalence. Well, a liter of water is equal to a kilogram of water. Why? Because the density of water is one gram per milliliter. Okay. I'm going to go through this step by step. Now, how many milliliters are there in a liter? A thousand milliliters per liter. All right. And how many grams are there in a kilogram? Here we go. So a thousand divided by a thousand is one, and uh, one liter of water weighs one kilogram. Right there. This cancels this. We're left with one kilogram, okay, per liter. So now we know the mass of the water, one kilogram. We know the temperature change, right? Initial is 20 and final is five. So it's five minus 20. So the change in temperature is equal to five minus 20 equals 15 degrees Celsius. Minus 15 degrees is the change in temperature. Temperature has dropped by 15 degrees. Now I know the problem doesn't show it as a negative, but I think it's important. So I'm, I'm going to put the negative in there. All right, so when we do the, the calculation, we get the heat removed is 15 kilocalories or minus 15 kilocalories equals Q. Now remember what I said about the convention, the sign convention is based upon the system. So if our system is here and we've got minus 15 kilocalorie change, which direction is it moving? Well, if we add it to the system, it's positive. If we subtract it from the system, it's negative. So that sign shows you right there that the system is losing energy to the tune of 15 kilocalories. All right. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that the calculations that we've, we've been doing uh, with this formula are for non-phase change operations. In other words, when you add heat to something, you cannot change the phase and use that formula. But we, phase changes do happen. So we need to account for that. We need to find a way to accommodate heat added to make a phase change. And for that, we need a definition. It's called latent heat. I'll define latent heat in a minute. First of all, um, what phases are we talking about? Well, basically solid, liquid, or gas. Right? So we get changes uh, from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas or go back the other direction. That's what we mean by phase change. 
Um, for instance, a, a pot of water heated to 100 degrees will turn to steam. And as long as you keep adding heat to the boiling water, you'll make more steam, but the temperature of the water will not change, right? So the formula that requires this will not work because there's no temperature change. When you change phase, uh, in this case at the boiling point, but even if you change phase at the freezing point, there's no change in temperature. So where does all that heat go? If you're adding heat to make, to uh, change the phase, well, the heat goes into breaking bonds between the liquid molecules so that now they're in the gas phase, right? They attract one another, that's why they're liquid. If you add enough heat, then you will break them apart and now they're gas. And you had to add energy to them to get that. That energy had nothing to do with the temperature change because there was none. All that energy at the boiling point goes into breaking those bonds. Okay, that's what that statement says right there. <clears throat> so this is just another way of saying the same thing. During phase change, in this case, liquid to gas is our example. The heat that you add to the liquid is used to separate the molecules. You're adding kinetic energy sufficient kinetic energy to each of the molecules so that they break bonds, intermolecular bonds, the bonds that are holding molecules together, separates them. Now, this heat that we add is known as latent heat or hidden heat. Why do we call it hidden? We call it hidden heat because it doesn't show up as a temperature change. Right? We do not detect it as a temperature change. We only detect it as a phase change. Okay. Now, there, for our purposes, we have three phases, right? Uh, solid, liquid, gas. So, uh, based on that fact, there are only two types of phase changes. The, between solid and liquid, and liquid and gas. Uh, for now, for this discussion, um, I'll elaborate in a minute. But the latent heat of fusion refers to melting point or freezing point, depending on which way you're going. If you're going from solid to liquid, it's a melting point. If you're going from liquid to a solid, it's freezing point. But the same amount of heat is exchanged in either process. For one, it goes one direction, for the other, it goes backwards the other direction. But it's still the same numerical value, the latent heat of fusion. By definition, is the amount of heat required to change one kilogram of a substance from the solid to the liquid phase at the melting point. And for water, that would be going from ice to liquid water requires 80 kilocalories per kilogram of water. Notice there's no temperature factor in here at all. All you need to know is how much ice is there? What's the mass of the ice? And if you have one kilogram, then you know it will take 80 kilocalories to melt it from solid ice at zero degrees to liquid water at zero degrees. No temperature change. Similarly, for boiling water, or for changing from a liquid to a gas, the latent heat of vaporization is the amount of heat required to change one kilogram of the liquid to one kilogram of gas at the boiling point. Okay, those are the definitions for latent heat of fusion, latent heat of vaporization.
Now, what does that look like in a graphical sense? Notice on this graph, we have on the x-axis, the heat that's being added. So from left to right, you're adding more and more and more heat, more heat, more heat, left to right. And on the y-axis, we're measuring a temperature change. So notice when you add more heat and the temperature does change, it goes up. See this positive slope right here? Add more heat, temperature goes up. Under that condition, there's no phase change. You're still solid in this case right here. If you do it for liquid, you get this line. And if you do it for a gas, you get that line. So for within a phase, these three positions, this solid, liquid, gas, as you add heat, you get a temperature change. But when you're at the melting point for this one from A to B, solid to liquid, there is no temperature change. Notice, for water, we're at zero degrees here. So as you add heat, you're actually melting ice into water. That's why when you have both ice and water together in a container and they're at zero degrees, there will be no temperature change. Adding heat, subtracting heat, doesn't matter. Temperature will remain constant until all of the ice is gone or all of the water is converted to ice, depending on what direction you're headed. The temperature will be constant. So as you heat ice, the temperature changes until you get to zero degrees and then it starts to melt. And there the temperature is constant until you've all melted all the ice. Now you start heating the liquid, right? And its temperature increases until you start making gas at the boiling point. And at that point, the temperature is constant until all the liquid is gone. And then once you've got gas, you can continue heating the gas or the steam. Okay. So this is just another way of saying that. At A, you have 100% solid at zero degrees. And at B, you have 100% liquid at zero degrees. At C, you have 100% liquid at 100 degrees. And at D, you have 100% gas at 100 degrees Celsius. All right, so uh, we can make this quantitative as well. So if you're uh, adding heat to ice, the specific heat of ice is 0 0.5 kilocalories per kilogram degree Celsius, right? And you use that formula, uh, Q then would equal to uh, mass, times specific heat times the change in temperature. Okay, and you would use this for the C value. When you get to this point, then you use a different formula, right? And in that case, the heat, the, the heat value is equal to the mass times the latent heat of fusion. Like that. Then once you're at B, you start heating the liquid, right? And now you use this formula again, only now you have a different specific heat, one kilocalorie per kilogram degree Celsius. And then when you get to 100 degrees and you start changing the gas, the boiling point, you use this one again, only now, you use the latent heat of vaporization, which is 540 kilogram, kilocalories per kilogram. Okay, and then once you get to uh, where you have all steam, all gas, then you go back to this formula and you use 
the uh, specific heat for steam at 0.5. So if you're trying to find out what's the, say you wanna know the temperature of a certain mass of water, if you start from ice and you add a certain number of kilocalories to it, where will it fall on this line? Well, you have to break it into pieces. You have to follow it to here until you've used up energy to get to that point and then you melt it and then you heat it up again and somewhere along these lines uh, you'll stop and at that point you will be able to tell what temperature right if it's in one of these curved lines then you will be using a delta t and finding what temperature it is if you've used up all your heat and you're up to this point and you use up the rest of your heat at the boiling point, then you know that the temperature is 100 degrees Celsius because you didn't make it to uh, all steam, in which case you would then be elevating the temperature again. Right? So it's a step-by-step -step process. And I think we have one of those problems um, to demonstrate in a minute or two. Okay, uh, next I wanna show you a diagram for um, understanding what processes can be going on, especially with phase changes, right? So we've talked about uh, melting, going from solid to liquid, liquid to gas is boiling, but in some cases, you can go straight from solid to gas. I think dry ice. Dry ice is solid carbon dioxide. And if you leave it out open, right, no insulation, it will absorb heat from the surface and from the air and convert from solid CO2 to gaseous CO2. Right, go straight from one to the other. That's called sublimation. There are many other things that do that also, but carbon dioxide is a good example. What if you go back the other direction? If you go from gas to solid, that's called deposition. All right, so uh, this diagram puts everything in perspective. So here are your three phases, solid, liquid, gas, if you go from solid to liquid, we already know you're either melting or you're freezing, depends on the direction you're going. If you're going from liquid to gas, you're either evaporating or boiling or condensing if you're going backwards from gas to liquid. And then if you're going straight from solid to gas or gas to solid, here's the, the uh, terminology for that also, sublimation to gas, deposition to solid. So I find this, arrangement useful to keep things in perspective and uh, remember the terms that are applied to each process. Okay, we've already defined this latent heat of fusion, the amount of heat required to uh, either well latent heat of fusion by definition is how much heat is required to melt one kilogram of solid to the liquid at the melting point. And it's simply the mass times the latent heat of fusion. I showed you that here, there. Latent heat of vaporization is this expression. You only have two terms. Here you have three terms. And this one is actually a combination. But for uh, phase change, you only have two terms, mass and the value for the latent heat. All right, so here's an example. Here's an example where we're going to calculate the amount of heat necessary to change 0 0.2 kilograms of ice at zero degrees into water at 10 degrees. So think about the processes that are required to do that.
So what do we know? We know that we have ice at zero degrees. Zero degrees. Uh, excuse me. Zero degrees Celsius. And we have to go to um, water, liquid water at zero degrees. And then we have to go to water at 10 degrees. Okay. Now, if we're going from, and we also have a mass, 0 0.2 kilograms. And that's going to be consistent all the way across. It's the same mass, right? We can't change mass. Mass, same here, here, here. So how much heat does it take to go from ice here to water there? Now we're talking about the latent heat of fusion. Okay. To go from here to here, we're talking about the specific heat of water. So we have two steps. We've got to melt the ice, then we've got to heat it up after it becomes water. So that means the total amount of heat is going to be the heat of fusion plus the heat of uh, let's see how would I say that the heat of uh, liquid water right how much heat do we need for the liquid water so we set these up as two independent calculations and then add the results together so for this one we're going to have 0 0.2 kilograms times the latent heat of fusion for water, which uh, uh, for ice, which is 80 kilocalories per kilogram. Right? I'm pretty sure that's right. There you go. They use H, which is fine. We're going to melt the ice and then we're going to change the temperature for the water. Okay. So there it is. This is the latent heat of fusion, and this is the change in temperature for the liquid water. So now we're going to have uh, mass and then we're going to have the C value for water, which is one, which would be kilocalories per kilogram degree C, and then change in temperature. So the final temperature is 10 degrees. What's the initial temperature? The initial temperature is zero degrees. Because we changed the phase, but we didn't change the temperature. So it's still at zero degrees. So this is 10 minus zero degrees C. Okay. And there it is. Right? There's that section. There's this section. Do the math. Add them together and you get 18 kilocalories. Right. 18 kilocalories to do this. All right. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier, I'll, I'll say it again, these uh, processes that we've been discussing so far occurred at one atmosphere pressure. Now, what effect does changing air pressure have on these processes? Well, if you increase the pressure, you increase the boiling point. That's the whole purpose behind a pressure cooker. You increase the pressure within the cooker and it causes the boiling point of the water to go up. So what that means is the water will not start boiling 
until the temperature is higher. Right? So it's still liquid at a higher temperature, which means under that amount of pressure, the heat that you add to the water actually goes into to increasing the temperature of the water because it won't boil. Only when water starts to boil are you stuck at that temperature. Okay? And most pressure cookers are set up so that you can, uh, uh, I think the maximum pressure is atmospheric plus 15 PSI. Put those little caps on top of your pressure cooker and when it starts to, to spit and rattle, then you've reached the boiling point at 15 PSI above atmospheric. So the pressure inside the, the uh, pressure cooker is 14.7 for atmospheric plus 15, which would be 29.7 PSI. Okay, inside your pressure cooker. And that increased pressure means that the water is not going to boil uh, until it reaches a significantly higher temperature. And I can't recall what that temperature is right now off the top of my head. So, okay, there's your pressure cooker. Um, and the reason food cooks faster is because you've increased the temperature within that container simply by increasing the pressure on the water and the water now heats up to a higher temperature before it boils. If you heat it up to boiling, then it stays at that temperature. Now, the opposite effect can happen if you are, uh, if you move to a higher altitude. In other words, say instead of um, Beckley, which is, uh, let me think, I back myself into a corner. What's our altitude here? I think we're at about a half a mile high, not quite a half a mile. Right. So we're actually at a lower air pressure here than we are than we would be at sea level. So in Beckley, uh, the boiling point of water should be lower than at sea level, say Charleston, South Carolina. That means that when the water boils here in an open pan, the temperature will be lower than it would be in, uh, at sea level. And if we go even higher, say to Denver, Colorado, which is a mile high, um, the temperature of boiling is even lower than that. And then of course the extreme is to go to the top of Mount Everest and try to boil water. It'll boil at a very, very low temperature, something in the neighborhood of maybe 80 or 83 degrees uh, Celsius is the boiling point at the top of Mount Everest. That's not in my notes, so I, I can't say for sure. Uh, at 10,000 feet in, in this particular location, these campers are going to boil their water and it's only going to get to 89 degrees Celsius. So that means if you want to cook your food without a pressure cooker, uh, then it's going to take you longer to cook it because the temperature is lower. Okay. So let's look at something else. What happens when water evaporates? Right? What causes water to evaporate? Right? If you're boiling it, you have to add, excuse me, you have to add heat. Well, if water evaporates, it's got to get heat from somewhere, right? Because it needs that kinetic energy to break the bonds and turn a liquid into a gas. So where does that heat come from? Well, it comes from, from the surroundings, right? You have the system is the water, 
and the surroundings or everything else. So the heat has to be transferred into the water to make it evaporate. So where does that come from? Well, if it's sitting on a surface, you'll get a lot of heat from the surface itself. And, and the surface will be cooled in order to make the water evaporate. If the water is sitting on your skin, then uh, a, most of the heat comes from your body. That's why evaporating water on the surface of your skin cools your body. It, well, it cools that section of skin. Um, and the heat is supplied to that water to overcome the latent heat of vaporization. In other words, the heat is added at that temperature to make the water evaporate. That's also known as evaporative cooling. When you see these big power plants and you see these uh, constructions out there, they, they're shaped like this like that, especially outside uh, nuclear power plants. What's happening is the water that serves to cool the reactor runs through this thing here and it's, it's sprayed actually. Actually, they're probably up here. They spray the water in there. And as it drifts down, they've got these big fans down here blowing air up that way and it evaporates some of that water all right so the water in order to evaporate takes heat with it so you've got heat being expelled in the gaseous phase of water vapor anything else that doesn't evaporate is cooler than it was before and that water collects down here and it runs off and goes back to the the reactor, okay? That's called evaporative cooling. <clears throat> That's why people sweat. That's why you sweat when you get hot. Your body is trying to remove heat by evaporating water. It's very efficient. Remember, it takes a lot of heat um, 540 kilocalories per kilogram is required to turn liquid water into gaseous water. So it's very effective at removing heat from your body. That's why we sweat. And the efficiency of the sweating and evaporation is much higher when the humidity is low because that way, uh, more water from your body evaporates faster in a dry environment than it does in a humid environment. That's why when you're, when the humidity is high, uh, 60, 70, uh, I've worked in 95% humidity before and it's not fun. Um, in, with high humidity environment, your body does not efficiently evaporate water, so you don't cool very well. But as long as you can evaporate some of that sweat, it carries the heat with it away from your body. All right. So now <clears throat> we're going to shift gears just slightly and uh, introduce the concept of heat transfer. We know that heat can transfer from one uh, material to another, but how does it do that? Well, there are three ways that heat is transferred. One is by conduction. That is when two substances are touching, they are able to transfer from the higher temperature to the lower temperature simply by impact of molecules at the surface. <coughs> That's conduction. In this case, this poker is in the flames and the gas is hot. So the gas is in contact with the poker and transferring some of its heat to the, the metal rod. That's conduction. 
Another way to transfer heat is by convection. In convection, you're actually transferring the mass of hot substance from one place to the other. Okay, that's the way we heat our homes. The air is drawn through your uh, heat pump or your gas furnace or whatever the case may be. Uh, well, uh, even baseboard heat works that way. And the air is heated and the hot air then is transferred out into the room by some form or fashion, either through from the vents or the baseboard heat, whatever the case may be. And that, that heated air is transferred from one place to the other. That transfers heat by convection. The third way is by radiation. Right? So anything that um, is warmer than its surroundings can transfer energy from one place to the other in light waves by radiation. That's the way the sun transfers its energy to the earth by radiation, sunlight. Um, and in fact, this way of transfer is extremely efficient. In other words, um, I'll get to that in a minute. Right there, I've got a slide on it, so I'm not going to steal my own thunder. So we have three ways of transferring uh, heat from one place to the other, conduction, convection, radiation. All right. Conduction requires that the objects be in contact. Uh, and the, uh, how well a substance conducts heat from one place to another depends on the, the bonding amongst them. And we can measure that. We can measure the thermal conductivity of a substance. How efficiently does it conduct heat? Uh, and express it as a number. Some substances conduct heat very well. For instance, if you take a, um, a metal bar, say uh, aluminum bar, and you stick one end of it into a fire, then pretty soon your hand's going to get hot. Aluminum is very efficient at conducting heat through itself. Um, other things do not conduct heat very well. For instance, uh, let's see, what would be a good example? Well, if you're holding that aluminum bar with um, an oven mitt, then the bar can get hot, but you won't feel it because the oven mitt is a thermal insulator. And it's based upon the premise that gases conduct heat much less efficiently than do solids. So your oven mitt has lots of gas pockets in it. That's the, the batting that's in your mitt uh, has trapped air in it. So it conducts heat much less efficiently. So you can hold on to a hot object with an oven mitt and not get burned. Uh, liquids are less efficient than solids as thermal conductors. Some liquids are, are better. So you, you sort of bridge the gap between gases and solids with liquids. Some liquids are pretty good conductors and some are not. As a general rule, we consider liquids and gases as insulators. And that's largely because their molecules are farther apart. So this energy transfer, this temperature, right? The average kinetic energy of the molecules in the substance, this energy transfer is much less efficient when the molecules are far apart. Because you have to transfer the kinetic energy from one molecule to the other in order for it to go and move to the next place. Metals are generally good thermal conductors, like that aluminum rod I was talking about. Here's an example of convection, right? So you have a fireplace, you have, uh, in this case, we have um, a blower system, 
right? So you can circulate the air. You could even heat the air down, down here somewhere and send it into the room. We're transferring that energy in bulk in the mass of the substance from one place to another. And then radiation, transferring energy by means of light, electromagnetic waves. Um, the uh, unique thing about light or electromagnetic waves is they can carry energy through a vacuum. In other words, there's no material there. There's no matter there, but the energy is still transferred in the process. Um, we know that dark objects absorb radiation very well and light colored objects do not absorb radiation very well. I mean, that's just intuitively, we understand know, and know that. Um, so when you think of energy transfer by radiation, think about the destination. Where is that energy going from where, from someplace to someplace? Um, if the energy is being transferred from the surface of the earth to space, what color is space? Space is essentially black, except for those tiny points of light from stars. So if you're transferring from the surface of the earth, heat from the surface to space, you have a very efficient absorber out there. That's why uh, on a clear night, even if the temperature is above freezing, it doesn't have to be, actually that's a mistake. It's not 32 degrees C. That should be Fahrenheit. Uh, what, what's meant here is freezing point. So zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. If the air temperature is above 32 degrees, you can still get frost on the windshield of your car due to the loss of energy from radiation. In other words, at that surface on your windshield, there's moisture in the air, but that surface is radiating energy, including radiating energy from the water, the water vapor, very efficiently to black space. And if you lose enough energy, then you will make the transition from liquid vapor uh, so, uh, excuse me, from the vapor, gaseous water, to the solid water. So you're actually uh, depositing uh, solid ice crystals on the surface of your windshield. Now, this radiation efficiency can be quantified. In fact, the heat transfer by radiation is proportional to the change in temperature, the difference in temperature, to the fourth power. That means it is extremely efficient. This change of temperature, I mean, it could be two degrees. And what's two to the fourth power? Well, two to the second power is four, to the eighth is 16, to the fourth is 32. Let's see, two, four, eight, 16, excuse me, 16 times. So the rate of transfer, uh, of, by radiation is 16 times as efficient as conduction. All right. So on a clear sky, the difference in temperature uh, between your windshield and the sky at night is 283 degrees, 283 K, which is a reasonable temperature in terms of K, what would that be? Right, to set, uh, 10 degrees, right? 10 degrees Celsius 
versus 4K, right? That's almost absolute zero. So the temperature difference there is huge. And then the energy transfer efficiency is T to the fourth. So um, you transfer a, a lot of energy off of their windshield and freeze ice very efficiently under those conditions. Okay. So we know that some uh, substances are thermal insulators. And a good, gen uh, good insulating material has an abundance of airspace in it, just like your oven mitt. So it inhibits the movement of heat. Um, a styrofoam cup is a good insulator because the styrofoam, the little styrofoam beads that are pressed into that cup have lots of gas spaces in there and they prevent the transfer of heat from one side to the other. Uh, goose down sleeping bags, a good example, right? The fluffy goose down in there traps lots of air spaces. That's why birds have down to keep them warm. Insulation in your house, spun fiberglass. So you have the solid matrix, but in between are lots of air spaces and they serve as insulation. Uh, double pane windows, which are um, common now in new home construction. They have double panes because there's trapped air between the panes and that reduces the transfer of energy from inside your house outside or from outside inside. If you're trying to cool your house, you don't want heat coming in. But very often also, those, the space between those panes is filled with argon. Argon, AR, is a uh, noble gas and it has the characteristic of being a very, very good thermal insulator, better than air. So its thermal conductivity is very low. So a high end double pane glass filled with argon uh, will do a much better job of insulating than one that simply has trapped air. We talked about potholders, we're not gonna talk about those anymore. How does a thermos bottle work? Well, a thermos bottle actually takes advantage of all three of the methods of heat transfer. Actually, it limits their application, all right? So um, we don't get convection, that is we don't transfer substance in and out, right? We have a lid on it. So that takes care of, of convection. Um, conduction, we have this space between here, this inner walled container and an outer wall container. Right? And between the two, there's a partial vacuum. Right? Remember, you can't, con you can't transfer by either conduction or convection if there's no substance there to do the transferring for you. There's no contact here and there's no substance, no gas or liquid that can circulate and transfer energy from one container to the outer wall. So that vacuum limits both conduction and convection. And then finally, radiation. Usually the, the inner glass container is silvered. It's, it's not gonna be silvered on the inside because uh, that would be leached out into your food, but it's silvered on this side. And what that does is it reflects heat away or into. If you have a hot substance in here, you want to reflect the heat back into the substance rather than radiate it away. And if you have a cold substance in there, you want to reflect heat from the outside, right? So it doesn't uh, heat up your cold uh, uh, drink or well, usually, usually a drink. All right, and that's what these statements are, are saying. I don't need to read those again. All right, so uh, just to review, the three common forms of, of matter, phases of matter, solid, liquid, and gas, and a combination of both pressure and temperature 
determines which phase the substance is in. With high temperature and low pressure, you're almost always going to get a gas. In between there, you'll get the liquid. And with very high pressure and low temperature, you can almost always make a solid out of a gas or a liquid. So at normal room pressure and temperature, so one atmosphere pressure and uh, normal temperature would be 20 degrees Celsius. Copper would be a solid under those conditions. Water would be a liquid and oxygen is a gas. Right? So under the same conditions of pressure and temperature, these three substances show different phases. Those, that is characteristic of that substance. And by the way, well, I'll save that discussion for chemistry. That's next semester. In solids, what are the molecules doing? They're not moving, right? Because solids have a definite shape and a definite volume. In other words, a solid can sit out here on the bench top. It can maintain its own shape and its own volume, as long as the temperature and, and pressure don't change. It will stay that way with no outside intervention. Now, why is that? That's because the molecules are locked into a position amongst each other. They don't move. They don't translate from one place to the other. So what can they do? Well, all they can do is vibrate. They can just quiver <laughs> right where they're sitting. So when you add energy to a solid in the form of heat, all it does is increase the vibration as long as it stays a solid. Now, there are two types of solids. They can be subdivided into crystalline solids. And most minerals uh, that you find, like rocks, are going to have a regular crystalline structure. What that means is that they have repeating units. So you could have. Um, so many silicon atoms here, and then you could have oxygen atoms, and then you could have iron atoms, and they will be in a regular arrangement. And then if you move over here, you find exactly the same arrangement here. It's called the unit cell. Those are crystalline structures. Uh, diamond is a good crystalline structure. Only diamond is composed of a single element, carbon, that's it but it is a regular crystalline arrangement of those carbon atoms. Now, like I said before, if you add energy, then they will vibrate. And that's what causes a solid to expand. If they're vibrating, they're pushing against each other. They're still in the same relative positions, but they're still banging against each other and they need more space to do that. So a solid will expand as you heat it. Most solids, I should say. The, those are crystalline solids. Amorphous solids are those that don't have an orderly arrangement of structure. Glass is, is an example of that. Glass has often been characterized as a supercooled liquid but that's neither here nor there. For our purposes, it's a solid, and it's an amorphous solid, and it does not have a regular crystalline structure most of the time. There are certain types of glass that can be uh, created with a crystalline regular structure, but in most cases, glasses are, uh, glass is amorphous, and there are many other solids that are also amorphous. They gradually become softer as you heat them. And the amorphous solids, actually, they have a melting range temperature. Um, whereas a crystalline solid, when you melt it, 
it will turn to liquid at a given temperature. Very easily defined and mark that temperature. But amorphous solids, as you heat them, they'll become softer and softer and softer. And it's really hard to tell when they change from solid to liquid. They have a, a temperature, a centered temperature for melting. <laughs> <clears throat> This is an example of a crystalline lattice, right? So you have this regular arrangement of molecules and when you heat them, they vibrate and they push each other apart and that's what causes the solid to expand. This is called the crystal lattice. A perfect example is salt. If you've ever spilled salt on a surface on a tabletop, and looked at it with a magnifying glass, you will find a perfect cube. And it's in a perfect cube because you have sodium ions surrounded by chloride ions, and they are also surrounded by sodium ions. And you have this regular structure that goes on forever. But their arrangement is in a perfect cube. So they go in here and they arrange themselves. Sodium chlorine, sodium chlorine, and then so forth on forever. There you go. These are naturally occurring crystals. You can find them in, in, the, in the ground sometimes. Uh, and this is called halite. It's a naturally occurring mineral of sodium and chlorine. And it forms that cubic shape because of the regular arrangement of the ions in its structure. So the macroscopic appearance of the crystal is a clue to the microscopic arrangement of the ions in the uh, substance at the, at the atomic level. How about liquids? The thing about a liquid is the molecules are free to move. They can move past one another. They still interact, but they move past one another. They're not locked into place. And that's why that although they have a definite volume for a given temperature, they don't have a definite shape. They cannot hold their shape. So that's why liquids have to be placed in a container. They rarely have any lattice arrangement at all. And if they do have a lattice arrangement, it's limited in scope and temporary. Now liquids also expand when they're heated because the molecules gain kinetic energy and they don't just vibrate, but they translate from one place to another. When they bang into somebody, it pushes them apart. And the faster they're going, the more energy they have, the farther they push apart. So as you heat up a liquid, it will also expand. How about gases? Gases, uh, the molecules in a gas are very far apart. There is almost no interaction amongst them at all, except in terms of transfer of collision in, uh, energy. So it's often useful to think of gases as billiard balls. They don't interact with one another. Well, actually they do, but on a theoretical basis, they just bang into one another. So this one's moving fast, it travels a long way, and then it finds another molecule, bang, transfers energy. So, um, they're definitely not locked into place and they don't even maintain their own volume. So a gas has to be held in a container on a three-dimensional basis. It has to be enclosed for both volume and shape. Okay. 
Now, the thing about gases is that they are very, actually, um, under most conditions that, uh, the, uh, under which we will investigate a gas, a gas responds to pressure, volume, and temperature as if it doesn't matter what the gas is. In other words, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, water vapor, noble gases like neon, argon, whatever, they will all behave the same way for given pressure, volume, temperature. It doesn't matter what the identity of the gas is. <clears throat> so that's useful, very useful. In fact, uh, in the uh, late 16th century, uh, early 17th century, uh, scientists were investigating gases because of that fact. They could investigate a gas, and it doesn't matter what the gas is. They could draw, they could um, uh, formulate laws about gas behavior regardless of the gas. So the initial investigations, the scientific investigations uh, relative to physics and chemistry were done on gases first. Now there's this other phase of matter that we encounter periodically on the Earth's surface. But plasma is, in nature, is largely restricted to areas, uh, places, where the, uh, there's a lot of heat. For instance, uh, this is in the extreme of kinetic energy. There's so much kinetic energy that the uh, atoms are ripped apart and you have free electrons and three positive ions where the electrons have been stripped off the atoms. This is an ionized gas, that is a plasma. Where are you gonna find that? Well, in out in nature, you're gonna find it around stars, for sure. Uh, in and around stars, you'll find plasmas. And the plasma gas that's expelled from a star, say with a, uh, uh, a coronal ejection process, those gases will be charged and they'll strike the Earth's, uh, actually they'll strike the Earth's uh, magnetic field and be deflected. Where else can you find a plasma? Well, uh, go to any muffler shop. Uh, most muffler shops now have what are called plasma cutters. And they take a gas and uh, under pressure, the gas is blown out the nozzle. Okay, so the gas, usually argon, is blown out this nozzle and the nozzle is negatively charged, right? So it, um, it makes a plasma out of that argon gas, a charged gas. And it's got a lot of energy. So that plasma cutter is just put next to a muffler or a, a tailpipe and it just cuts it off, slices it like a hot knife through butter. That's one way uh, plasma is formed. Another way, a lot of research is being done on the process of nuclear fusion as a way of generating um, an endless supply of energy. Well, what we've discovered is that uh, one way of doing that is to ionize the gas, which is helium primarily, ionize the helium, and we do that so that we can keep it in a magnetic bottle and under high pressure and high temperature, then you can get those helium atoms to fuse, the helium nuclei to fuse. But you have to form a plasma before you can do it. Uh, up in the ionosphere of the Earth's atmosphere, you have plasmas, ionized gases, 
And like I said before, plasma is considered a completely independent phase of matter. All right, so now um, we've only talked about laws uh, governing the way uh, matter behaves. There's a very important theory that explains why matter behaves the way it does. And it was formulated originally for gases. So that's why it's called the kinetic theory of gases. And you can surmise from the, from the name of the theory that it has to do with kinetics, that is motions of atoms and molecules. Everything's in motion. And then we're talking about gases in particular. Now, the, the theory itself has since been expanded to include other phases of matter, but originally it was for gases. Okay, and it goes like this. First of all, you recognize that a gas consists of molecules that are moving independently from one another, right? They're so far apart that they're basically independent entities. And they're moving in all directions at very high speed. In fact, in my chemistry course, we calculate the speed, uh, the average speed of a gas molecule at a given temperature. And at room temperature, we find out that it's moving faster than the speed of sound. So they're moving very fast. Now, the higher the temperature, the higher the average speed, right? We've already said this. The temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules in a substance, right? So we can derive from that, uh, we can surmise from that, that these molecules of gases, or the atoms as the case may be, uh, are moving faster for higher temperatures, okay? These molecules collide with one another. Even though they're very far apart, they still do collide. And they collide with the walls of the container. All right, that's the first key to understanding the kinetic theory of gases. They collide with the walls of the container. If they did not collide with the walls of the container, and transfer some of their kinetic energy to the walls of the container, we would not be able to measure pressure. Right? Pressure by definition is a force applied per for a unit area. So if you have this unit area here and you apply a force to it, then you measure pressure force applied for that unit area. So this would be like Newtons per square meter would be a pressure. Well, how do you get pressure on the surface of your vessel? If you put a gauge there and you try to measure the pressure of the gas, then those gas molecules must strike the detector with sufficient force to transfer it to the system that measures that pressure. So those collisions with the walls of the container are central, essential, to understanding the kinetic theory of gas. That explains why you can measure pressure, right? We're not just saying that you get pressure, we're saying this is why you get pressure, because those fast moving molecules strike the walls of the container. Now, like I've said before, the distance between the molecules is very large compared to their size. In other words, and for all intents and purposes, we can assume that the gas molecules have no volume of their own. That's what this means, point volume. Remember in mathematics, that, that little dot means it has no dimensions. It has no length, no width, no height, right? That's a point. So if you, if you represent a gas molecule as a point, it has no volume. That's why we say point volume for the gas molecules. Because they're so far apart and they're moving so fast, 
they behave as if they have no volume. That's why one gas, uh, a law for one gas works for another gas. Because we can ignore the gas molecule itself. All right. So there's, there's where the pressure comes from, whether it's in a solid container, or in a balloon, a ball, whatever the case may be, it's be due to the collisions of these billions of gas molecules against the walls of the container. That's where we measure pressure. If you have more gas molecules stuffed into the same volume, you will get a higher pressure, right? Why? Because there are more collisions the more collisions you have, the more force is being transferred to the same area. So you get a higher pressure. So more gas molecules stuffed into the same volume gives you higher pressure. Okay? There you go. That explains why adding more gas molecules means higher pressure. Okay, there's our definition, force per unit area. And the unit of measure is a derived unit. Well, Newton is a derived unit. Uh, meter is a fundamental unit. So we're, we have a derived unit from a derived unit. And this is called the Pascal. So one of these is equal to one of those. Okay. But very often it's more convenient to use um, a, a common unit, the atmosphere. The atmosphere can be related to something we know. So at sea level, one atmosphere is the average pressure that you would experience over a long period of time in multiple measurements. And it's been standardized. So uh, one atmosphere by definition is normal atmospheric pressure at sea level and zero degrees Celsius. Now here's the relationship, right? Conversion factors again. One atmosphere equals 1.01 times 10 to the fifth pascals. Right. So what is that? Um, let's see, five zeros. So that's a hundred thousand pascals, approximately. A hundred thousand pascals is one atmosphere. And if we're measuring it in the English system, that's pounds per square inch, fourteen point seven pounds per square inch is one atmosphere. So when you measure the pressure in your tire with a tire gauge, it usually gives you the the reading in pounds per square inch. All right. So, um, based upon the definition of pressure, if you apply the same force, but over a smaller area, you get a higher pressure, right? If you make this one smaller, then that term makes a bigger pressure. So that's why uh, I can press against my the palm of my hand with my finger and it doesn't poke a hole. But if I apply the same force with a sharp object, it's applying that same force over a smaller area and then it might go through my hand. That's the illustration here with this push pin. And that's why hypodermic needles can be used because you're applying the same force over a very small surface area at the point of the needle and it goes right in. <clears throat> that's why sharp knives are better than dull knives. What's the saying? You never cut yourself with a sharp knife. You always cut yourself with a dull knife because you have to apply more force and there's more chance of getting off center and slipping and cutting something that you don't want to cut. If the knife is sharp, then very little force will make the cut exactly where you want it.
So that's the purpose for sharp knives. All right, so now we're gonna get into a, an abbreviated discussion of the gas laws. Now I've got several slides here, but these slides were derived from uh, the authors. And while useful, um, I, I don't think they organize the information very well. Uh, it's best to organize discussion of gas laws in terms of how they were developed. So that's what I'm gonna do here. Um, these slides may be helpful, and I'm going to uh, leave that slide there and talk about the gas laws on the board. All right, so the first gas law I'm going to discuss is Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law relates the pressure of a gas to its volume. So Boyle said that if you multiply pressure times volume, you get a constant value. So what does that mean in practical terms? That means all other things being equal, right? You don't change the temperature, you don't change the volume. Uh, excuse me, you do change the volume. You don't change the temperature and you don't change the amount of gas in the container. Then if you increase the pressure, the volume must decrease. Right? In order to have a constant value, if this goes up, that one has to go down, and vice versa. If this one goes, increases volume, then the pressure has to go down in order to be constant. That's Boyle's Law. Okay, the next law is Charles' Law. Charles relates volume and temperature. Let's see, we'll make those different constants. Charles says that if the pressure is constant and the amount of gas is constant, doesn't change, then if you increase the temperature, the volume has to increase, right? This was a product, this is a quotient. So if you increase this value, that one has to go up also in order to keep this one constant. Or if you, uh, increase pressure, increase the volume, then the temperature has to increase in order to keep that constant. Okay, that's the second law. The third law is Avogadro's law. Avogadro's law relates volume and amount of gas. Okay. That little n is a value for how much gas is there. In other words, how many particles of gas, not mass, but how the number of gas molecules, right? And we'll talk about this in a second semester. This value is the mole. But you don't have to remember that one for this class, right? I'm just saying that, that you'll get, get it again when we talk about chemistry. So if you increase the amount of gas, like you pump more gas uh, under the same pressure, then the volume has to increase. It just stands to reason. If you put more gas into, a, into a, uh, an area and the pressure is constant, then the volume is going to change. Okay, so those are the three basic laws and you can combine those three laws into a combined gas law, where pressure times volume divided by moles times temperature is a constant. Okay, that's the combined law. So pressure times volume divided by moles times temperature is equal to a constant value. So in this case, you could change more than one of them and still maintain the constant value. Um, now, uh, 
how do you solve that equation if you don't know what the constant is? Well, um, we rarely ever know what the constant is under these circumstances. So what we do is we set these up in terms of uh, before and after conditions. If these are the before conditions, then the after conditions should also be equal to that K value, right? If you increase the pressure, then the volume decreases, but it's still equal to that K value. So in that case, after the experiment, these two values are also equal to that constant, right? So what's that math, the math uh, relationship? If A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. So we can do away with the constant. This is before, this is after. And you can do the same thing for each of these others. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2, right? Before and after. You can do the same thing here. One, 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 one. So that's before, and this is after. Okay, combined gas law, before and after. Now suppose the, the amount of gas is constant, both sides. We didn't change it. And the temperature is the same, both sides. We didn't change that either. Under those circumstances, these terms go out. And if these are both constant, then you have Boyle's law. So that's the beauty of the combined gas law. If you hold two of these constant, then you can construct any one of those laws from this one, all right? Now, <clears throat> that's if you know the before conditions and the after conditions. So if we know it's this one and that pressure, that pressure, that volume before, and now we've changed it to this pressure, then we can solve for that unknown, right? Just like any equation, if you have one unknown, you can solve it. All right. Now, I don't believe there's any need for you to remember Boyle's, Charles, Avogadro's law for, for this course. I just put that up there to show you the progression. And these laws were developed um, chronologically. First Boyle's, then Charles, then Avogadro's in history. But you'll also notice that um, there are cer certain circumstances where um, you don't know the before and after conditions. You only know the conditions right now, known as a state function. Remember that? Those are the conditions now. How are we going to solve that problem? Well, for gases, we have uh, P, V, N, T equals our constant. Right? Well, if we fix the relationship of these values together, we can calculate a constant. Then we will have that constant available for state function solutions. All right? So for, for the ideal gas, if the volume is one liter, um, excuse me, no, that's not right. If the pressure is one atmosphere and the number uh, the amount of gas is one mole and the temperature is um, zero degrees, standard temperature for gas, which is 273K, right? For all these gas laws, the temperature has to be in K rather than Celsius. Then this value is going to be 22.4 liters, volume of that gas. Then if you combine these all together, you get 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole 
K. And that is given a special symbol called R. That's the ideal gas constant with these units of measure, right? Okay, so we can say this is equal to that. Now, if we know three of these plus our constant, we can solve for the other one. It doesn't matter how it got there. Okay, so that's in a slide also coming up. Now, let's go back to the slides and say, how do they relate to what I just talked about? Pressure and number of molecules. So pressure and number of molecules, right? If you want to relate these two only, then volume and temperature must be constant. If they are constant, then we can say something about the pressure and the number of molecules. If you increase the number of molecules, you increase the pressure, right? And the kinetic theory of gases tells us that more molecules means more collisions with the walls of the container, which means higher pressure. All right. Um, so temperature is held constant, 27 degrees, yes. Uh, this is not exact, this is not right. Because here it says the volume is held constant and the volume there is obviously different. So that's another error. I need to fix that. Uh, temperature and volume are held constant. Okay, so that doesn't work. That's a problem. If the temperature and the volume are held constant, then if you shove more molecules into that same space, you get a higher pressure. Now, if we had this level up here at the same level there, but we had more of these dots with arrows in there for the same volume, then it would be an accurate picture. But this one is not, that is a mistake. If the volume and the number of moles are held constant, this one and that one are held constant, then pressure and temperature are directly proportional. In other words, as temperature goes up, pressure goes up. Why would that be, right? We know that's true for the law, the law says so, but why? As the temperature goes up, the average kinetic energy of the molecules increases. That means they strike the walls with more force because they have more energy. And more force means higher pressure. So that's the why. This is the law, this is the what, and the explanation I just gave you is the why. Okay, this is an accurate picture. Volume and the number of molecules held constant. But if we heat this one up, you get more pressure because each of the molecules has more kinetic energy. Okay, if the number of moles, N and T, are held constant, these are constant, then the pressure and the volume are inversely related. In other words, as the pressure goes up, the volume goes down. And just take a balloon, well, a small enough one you can fit in your hands, and press on it, you can decrease its volume by the pressure of your hands. Okay? So, ah, here's the problem. This one right here should be swapped with the one that we got wrong before. So let's make myself a note. I'll fix that one <clears throat> before and uh, replace it in Blackboard so you, you'll see the right slides in the right uh, relationship to the, uh, uh, to the laws. Okay, 
Here's the combined gas law. Uh, let's see. Well, these are statements of the combined gas law. This just says that pressure is proportional to the amount of gas, the temperature, and inversely proportional to the volume. That's another way of saying this relationship is a constant. It's just a rearrangement. Okay, this is another way of saying it, before and after, right? If we set this one, P1V1 over N1T1 equal to P2V2 over N2V2, you'll get this expression, okay? It's easier for me to remember it that way. Have all your ones on this side and all your twos on that side, rather than mixing them up like this. I think it's easier to see it the other way. And the way they've arranged it here, N must be constant. The number of molecules of gas must be constant. But if you express it this way, then you can introduce it also as a variable. Here we go. This is a more useful form. That's the one I like. Okay, now we have the, uh, this is the combined gas law example. So we have a closed container filled with hydrogen gas. The initial pressure is 1.8 times 10 to the six pascals at 20 degrees. What will be the pressure at 40 degrees? All right, so look at your, look at your before and after. This is not a state function, this is before and after. You know conditions before and you know some of the conditions after. So the pressure there is going to change here, right? The volume is what? The volume didn't change, right? So the volume's gone. How about the number of moles, the, number, the amount of gas in, a, in this rigid container? It's the same before and after, so it's gone too. So now we have this temperature. We have a temperature here, we have a temperature here. So we solve for that one, all right? What's the pressure? 1.8 times 10 to the six pascals. All right, and what's the initial temperature? 20 degrees. Ah. But 20 degrees, it has to be in Kelvin. This is our unknown, and this is our new temperature, 40 plus 273. There you go. So you say this one times that one divided by this one gives you the pressure. Now let's see if I did it right. Yep, you have to convert the temperature to Kelvin. Just add 273 and then solve for P. So this one is uh, 313 times this one divided by that one. And we find out that now the pressure is 1.92 times 10 to the six pascals. So did it do what we expect? We increase the temperature, should the pressure go up? Yes, it should. The pressure goes up. It went from 1.8 to 1.92 times 10 to the six pascals. Here's your ideal gas equation that I described earlier. It's often written this way, PV equals NRT. That's a constant. Now that constant is only valid if this volume is in liters, this pressure is in atmospheres, this is in moles, and this is in K for temperature. 
right? So for this state function, these units of measure are absolutely inviolable. They must be those values, liter, atmospheres, mole, K. Otherwise, it will not work. If you use different units of measure, you need a different constant. Okay. Now, let's see, we're going to talk, we just have a few slides to talk about thermodynamics. We're not going to go into a lot of detail. Thermodynamics is a huge subject area, but we just want to touch on it. So what do we mean by thermodynamics? Well, thermo, of course, means heat. Right? And dynamics means motion. So what we're actually talking about is how does heat move? Where does it go and what does it do on its way? Um, and for practical purposes, what we usually do with thermodynamics is convert some heat into work. Remember what work is? Force times distance. So we want to take some of that heat and convert it into a force applied through a distance. So we, you're basically talking about heat engines. A heat engine takes a difference in heat uh, and extracts some of that heat to be used to do work. Now, there are lots of different types of heat engines. Uh, car engines are very common. Actually, refrigerators have heat engines in them too, but they're heat engines that run backwards, <laughs> right? Think about it. Uh, a car engine gets hot and it transfers that heat to a heat sink to the air, which is at a lower temperature. And in the transition, it takes some of that heat and makes work out of it. But a refrigerator, takes heat and moves it from a one area to a warmer area, it goes the wrong direction, right? So it's actually a heat engine running in reverse. This is one interpretation of the first law of thermodynamics. Remember, I think in the last chapter, I showed you the, the universal expression for the first law of thermodynamics. The change in energy in the entire universe is zero. In other words, the amount of energy we've got in the universe now is the same amount of energy we've had forever and will ever have. There's no change. Now, on a local level, you can get changes in energy, but you still have to balance. You can't create it, you can't destroy it. Now, the authors of this text uh, use an alternate definition for the first law of thermodynamics. The heat that's added to a closed system goes into the internal energy of the system and or doing work, which is true. That is true. And it requires that you balance the transfer of energy. Okay, in a closed system, remember, you can transfer energy, but you can't transfer matter. So you can transfer energy into a system or it can leave the system. Now we've used a term here that hasn't been defined, the internal energy. The internal energy of a system is everything, all the energy that could it possibly have in any form at all. That could be heat energy, that could be kinetic energy, that could be any kind of potential energy, it's all internal energy to the system. So here's what that says. This heat that we add to the system goes in two different places. It either goes to the internal energy of the system or it becomes work. Okay, 
That's what that means. And we use our um, sign conventions here also for work, uh, just like we do for heat. If work is being done on the system, it's a positive value. If work is being done by the system on its surroundings, it's a negative value. This is the alternate definition that I gave you earlier. Conservation of energy is the first law of thermodynamics. In the universe or in an isolated system, the change in energy is always zero. So this is what a heat engine might look like. <clears throat> For a spontaneous transfer of energy, you need a hot source and a cold reservoir, relatively speaking. The reservoir has to be colder than the hot, otherwise the heat won't flow. So we've got heat flowing from this hot source to this cold sink. And in the process, we extract some of that heat in the form of work. Okay. Now, the second law of thermodynamics says that it is impossible for heat to flow spontaneously from a cold body to a hot body. It won't flow backwards. It only goes one way. Now that's one way of expressing the second law of thermodynamics. Um, and there are other ways, of course. But the illustration here is for the spontaneous flow of heat between these two uh, blocks is from the higher to the lower. If they're the same temperature, you get no transfer. In fact, they are at equilibrium with each other. And this one never occurs spontaneously, right? In and of its own accord. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't transfer heat from a low temperature to a high temperature, but in order to do that, we have to input, we have to do work in order to accomplish that. We don't extract work from the transfer, we put work in to make it happen. That's non-spontaneous. And there's a corollary to the second law of thermodynamics. When you operate a heat engine and you do work with it, you never convert 100% of the energy transferred into useful work. It's never 100% efficient. There's always some that's lost in the process. And we give that wasted heat a special name. It's called entropy. Now, without going into a further discussion, which would take another couple of hours, um, just think of entropy as wasted heat from a heat engine. It cannot be recovered. And it always occurs. Now, the third law of thermodynamics is, is sort of theoretical. It's not something that we generally make everyday use of. It just says it's impossible to attain a temperature of absolute zero. You'll never get zero K. That makes zero K the lower limit. Okay. So notice that here we have a hot reservoir and a low temperature reservoir. And now we're transferring heat from the low to the high. In order to do that, we have to input work, right? So this is a heat pump. It's pumping heat from a cold reservoir to a hot reservoir. That's how heat pumps work to cool your house. We're taking heat from this uh, cooler environment and sending it outside to a warmer environment. And in order to do that, we have to do work to make it happen. Um, one way to think of it is the heat pump is the opposite of a heat engine operating in spontaneous mode.
Now, just a couple more words about entropy. That lost energy, that lost heat, when we do work and transfer heat from one, from a high temperature to a low temperature, that entropy uh, can be thought of as uh, increased disorder. That's not the final definition for it. And in fact, it's an imperfect definition, but it's convenient to think of it as disorder. Um, example, uh, if, you, if you have a balloon with a gas inside under pressure, it's confined to that space. And if you pop the balloon, what's gonna happen? Well, under pressure, the gas escapes. Well, the gas escapes into a larger volume, correct? So if it escapes into a larger volume, it has more space to occupy. It has more disorder from the smaller space to the larger space. That's one way of thinking of disorder. Most natural processes, not all, but most, natural processes lead to an increase in disorder. Um, a natural process that leads to more order would be freezing water on a pond. The temperature outside is cold, cold enough so that energy is extracted from water and rather than the disordered water molecules in the liquid phase, they arrange themselves into those hexagonal crystal lattice structure of ice that is more ordered, right? So in that case, the entropy runs the other direction. So what's the, the end story to uh, thermodynamics? It says that eventually the universe is going to cool down and finally come to an even temperature throughout the entire universe. It'll, it'll take billions and billions and billions of years to happen. But thermodynamically speaking, that's what's expected, right? Because every time you use energy, every time it transfers from one place to the other, it loses uh, its ability to do work. Uh, let's see, what's the terminology for that? It's degraded. As energy is transferred, heat is transferred from high temperature to low temperature, its usefulness is degraded. In other words, you can no longer extract that work from it. It went from here to here. You extracted work. Now that work is gone. It's doing something. You have to go from this one to that one to get more work out of it. And each step you take, degrades its usefulness, because now you can't get that work out of it that you got before. Um, if you want to get the maximum amount of work out of this spontaneous transfer of heat, then the process, um, the spontaneous process, is really only hypothetical. The maximum amount of work can never be obtained. Why? Because of entropy. You always lose some in the process. But theoretically speaking, um, you can set up a process where it's called um, a reversible process. Now, this is purely theoretical. The changes take place in such small increments that the process is said to be reversible. And if it's reversible, then you could theoretically obtain all of the work from that transfer without any losses. But that just leads us to the obvious conclusion that there are no uh, reversible processes in the universe. They're all irreversible. And some energy is wasted in the process. 
So here's, here's a little uh, series of statements that I, I found comical. The first law, right, the change of energy is always zero, means you can't win. You can only break even, right? In other words, you can't get more energy out of a system than you put in. So there's a certain amount of energy in there, and you can only get a certain amount out, and you can't create it. You can't destroy it. You can't create it. All right, that's what breaking even means. Unfortunately, the second law says you can't even break even, right? Because every time you transfer energy uh, in the form of heat, you will waste some energy in the process. And the only way to get all of the energy out of it is for your heat sink to be at absolute zero. And since you can never get there, you'll never get all the energy out that's available. So you can't break even. And the third law just says, you can't even get out of the game, you're stuck. Since you can't achieve absolute zero, there's no exit door to this process. <laughs> you can't get out. So you can't win, you can't break even, you can't get out of the game. All right. So let's see, uh, I've got a couple more slides and these are just review slides. Okay, so these important equations, calculating Kelvin from Celsius, you just add 273 to it. And this is really the only one you need to remember because if you have Kelvin and you wanna, and you wanna know Celsius, then all you have to do is rearrange the equation and solve for the unknown. So you really don't need to know both of them. Uh, same thing for Celsius and Fahrenheit relationship. Fahrenheit equals 1.8 times Celsius plus 32. If you know that one, then you can solve for the other one, right? Because it's the same equation, just rearranged. This equation you need to remember, the heat from a change in temperature for a substance is proportional to the mass of the substance, is specific heat value and the change in temperature. If there's a phase change, then you need to know the mass and the latent heat for that substance. Then you can calculate that phase change heat exchange. The gas laws, right? You've got all these gas laws, but this one's the best one. Right here, that one or Oops, I left out one. That one or the ideal gas equation. PV equals NRT. And R, with those units that we specified, atmospheres for pressure, liters for volume, moles for N, or the number, the amount of substance, and Kelvin for temperature, then the R value is 0 0.08206. But for before and after situations, this one works perfectly well. Okay, that is it for chapter five.